Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verse 1 this morning, and if you're visiting with us, there's two things I would like to make you aware of. One is we are doing a verse-by-verse study through the letter of Hebrews to a Jewish congregation, some of which trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as the Messiah. Others have been convinced but not yet trusted, and still others not convinced. There's also a fourth category that we've touched on multiple times, and that is uh, those who may have at one point been convinced, but have walked away from that belief. And that group gets addressed as well. Uh, The second thing I want to make you aware of, if you're visiting with us, there are two ways that we provide every Sunday morning for you to gain access to my notes that I'm preaching from. Uh, We've learned that if you're able to engage multiple Uh, senses while you're listening and seeing and and being able to read along that you're able to grab hold of the truth so much better and follow along. Uh, So there there are physical copies of the notes on the stage, but you can also go to our website and pull them up on your smart device. Uh, The sermon notes are posted there. I want you to have that available to you. So I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1, and let me just introduce this verse by saying there's a little bit of a shift in the writer's direction here. We have been in a chapter of him proving that Jesus is the great high priest. We have been in a chapter of of the writer showing that Jesus is better than the priesthood of Aaron, that he came from a different priesthood, which we learned was the priesthood of Melchizedek, one who was both a priest and a king that you'll hear more about in a moment. Uh, but now there's a little bit of a shift. While he continues the theme of Jesus is a greater high priest all the way through chapter 10, the shift that he makes is that his ministry is better. So for chapter 8, there's a specific focus on the ministry that this high priest performs. It is better. Uh, and and verse, eight, uh, verse 1 of chapter 8 gives us a summary statement. And if anyone were to ask you, what is the main point of the book of Hebrews, you don't have to guess because he tells you what the main point is. It is chapter 8, verse 1, when he says this is the main point of these things. And so we're going to be looking at that main point. And I would contend that the main point of the letter is very simple. It is that Jesus, our great high priest, is seated. I think that's the main point of the entire letter. He is seated. Because that's, that alone sets him apart from any other priest that has ever existed. So this morning, I want to read verses 1 through 6 as the first segment of the chapter. We will uh, cover a majority of that next week. Uh, but I want to kind of do an introduction of the main point this week in verse 1. But I want to invite you to stand if you are able as we honor the reading of our text this morning. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle... For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. A better covenant with better promises. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be our great high priest, bringing a better covenant a more superior ministry, a higher priesthood that now allows us to come into your presence and worship you today. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to just take a moment and define to you what a covenant is so that you will understand the significance of a covenant changing. Okay, so a covenant establishes how you can relate to someone. It is basically the rules of engagement or it is the terms of a relationship. All right, so I'll give you an example of this. Marriage is a covenant. That means that the marriage covenant dictates how a husband and a wife should relate to one another. Meaning they are in a covenant together. It is the terms of the relationship. All religions on this earth, every religious system does exactly that. They seek to establish how they want you to relate to God. How man relates to God. Every religious system is set up that way. So when there is a change in the covenant, and you need to grasp this because this is a a major point of the text. When there is a change in the covenant, that means there is a change in the way man can relate to God. There is a change in the terms of the relationship. What did this new covenant bring that the old covenant could not provide? The new covenant had the power to fully forgive someone's sin, saving them once for all. This satisfaction of God's wrath toward the sinner was fully accomplished through Christ's sacrifice. And I just want to tell you the the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant that is rooted in the satisfaction of this, satis- of this sacrifice or of this uh, wrath that God has upon sin, uh, any religious practice that depends upon the performance of man is limited and flawed by that man's sin. But we have such a high priest, as listed in verse 1, who has ushered in a new covenant that is completely unstained by sin, Because it is brought in by a high priest who is unstained by sin. There are three things mentioned in verse 1 of which we will read again uh, before we kind of dissect it this morning. That make Christ's high priestly ministry so much more superior to any other earthly ministry. So look at verse 1 again. It says, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The three things we're going to look at today. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens. So the first thing that's mentioned here is his perfection. The reason why his perfection is mentioned, uh, if if you remember, we've covered this multiple times that in the scriptures, when it was written, when these letters were written, they were not divided by uh, chapter and verse. And so there would not have been a break between verse 28 of chapter 7 and verse 1 of chapter 8. There's a break in our mind because when we're reading it, we jump to a new chapter or we jump to a new heading because our study Bibles have it broken out. But it would have been a continuous letter. And so look back at verse 28. To see what that word now is referring to in verse 1. Verse 28 ends with, uh, there is this son that has been appointed who has been perfected forever. He has been totally perfected forever to reign as high priest. Now, because he has been perfected forever, we have such a high priest. So it helps us to find that word such. What kind of high priest? A high priest who has been perfected forever. Why is that important? Uh, early, earthly priests had to first offer a sacrifice for their own sins before they would be welcome to come into God's presence and offer a sacrifice for their people's sins. They were flawed men. They were sinners themselves. And and they wouldn't stay in there very long in case they might sin while they're in there and drop dead in the presence of God because God cannot be in the presence of sin. So you can see 
that this earthly ministry was inferior to the one that Jesus participated in because he had no sin. He had been perfected forever. They would make sacrifices in the presence of God on behalf of their people. But since Jesus is already seated in the sanctuary of the presence of God, he has perfectly offered the perfect sacrifice. And he did it, as we learned last week, he did it once for all. That means all at once. He only needed to make one sacrifice, not for his own sin, but for ours. His work is continuous. Unlike the temporary work of the earthly priest, he's able to stay in there because he's perfected forever. Jesus Christ left heaven to come to earth in order to pick up the role and title of great high priest, then to return to heaven, sit on the throne, and eternally serve in that role. I read a quote this week as I was studying this verse from the theologian Philip Hughes. I think he describes this attaining the role of high priest very well. Listen to these words. Jesus left heaven as the Son of God. He returned both as Son of God and also by reason of the incarnation as Son of Man. He left as Lord. He returned both as Lord and also as minister on our behalf in the presence of the Father. He left as King. He returned both as King and also as High Priest and Intercessor for those whom He is not ashamed to call His brethren. He left as sovereign. He returned also as Savior. So when you think about Jesus descending to earth, taking on human flesh, sacrificing himself, returning to heaven as our high priest, perfected forever and to perform that role forever. By coming to earth and by his work as God's servant and our substitute. Christ established a ministry that is superior in every way to all other systems of approach to God. To all other covenants. To all other establishments of this relationship who try to tell you, you can relate to God in this way. Christ has come to create a superior ministry above all else. That's why he alone, and this is probably one of the most important statements I will make this morning, To believer and unbeliever alike, please hear these words. He alone is able to meet our need as sinners before God's throne. He alone. Because he's perfected forever. We'll expound on that more in just a moment. The second point that is made in verse 8 has to do with where Christ has sat down. Seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. He is both priest and king. Jesus has taken his royal place at heaven's throne. We've already learned in our study of Hebrews that this was not true of any other prophet uh, or any other priest except for one. There was only one other priest known to man, known to the Jews, who had ever held both offices priest and king, and it was Melchizedek. And it's very important to understand that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, not of the order of Aaron. Why? Because Jesus is both priest and king. What does that mean? The kings played a very significant role in the Old Testament. The book of Kings records the record of what king ruled during what generation. And there's something that we learn from that. If you go and you read First and Second Kings, you'll have a good king and the, the nation of Israel does really well and turns back to God and focuses on his word. And then that king dies. He gets replaced by another king who rebels against God and doesn't focus on his word. And guess what the nation does? The nation follows his character. So goes the king, so goes the kingdom. The kingdom takes on the persona or the personality or the morals or the priorities or the values of its king in whatever season it's in. So it's important to have a moral king. It's important to have, in our case, a perfect king because so goes the king, so goes the kingdom. 
The moral character and example of the king greatly impacted the character of the nation. Imagine the anxiety that would arise in the nation when it was time to change kingship. You say, well, things are going pretty well, but that's temporary because it's all based on how this next king is going to be. And unfortunately, when you read First and Second Kings, what you find is you got a good king, then you have like two or three bad kings before you get another good one. And so there's a lot of time spent uh, wayward and in disobedience and ignoring God in the kingdom. And so there would be a lot of anxiety when this kingdom was about to shift, when a, a new king was about to be appointed. And I tell you, what a blessing it is under this kingdom of God who this king who has ascended to sit on the throne in heaven and play a pivotal role on our behalf, that his kingship will never be replaced. Amen? He will be our king forever. He will be our high priest forever and has been perfected forever. This king single-handedly determines God's attitude toward those who are in his kingdom. And we don't have to worry about there being a change in the kingship. There's something to be said about Christ's positioning on this heavenly throne. It says very specifically, the writer of Hebrews highlights, this king is seated at the right hand of God. I want to tell you two things about that right-handed seat. All right, so first thing is, the right hand was always used as a reference of power. Your right hand was your strong hand. And so in this reference of power, what that means is the one who is seated at the right hand is sitting in a position of power and exaltation. He is sitting there to rule with a strong hand. But there's something else really cool about this right seat that I learned about in my study. Because what you have to do... And I, I try to do this in my sermons. I think it's important that we look at the context, that we see who the original audience is, so that we can understand why he said what he did, what is he referring to when he said it, how would they have interpreted it, how would they have received it. So I want you to listen with a Jewish ear for a moment. When they heard that Jesus is sitting at the right hand, let me tell you one thing that could have come to their mind. There was this thing called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men who were in charge of enacting justice in the land. They were the, the, the judgment of the land. Their responsibility was to hear the case, decide on the case, rule on the case, and issue either condemnation or acquittal that the person is not guilty. The Sanhedrin was responsible for carrying out justice. All right, so in the Sanhedrin of these 70 men, where the judges sat in the Sanhedrin, there were two scribes. All right? There was a scribe that sat to the judge's left, and there was a scribe that sat to the judge's right. The scribe that sat on the left, guess what his job was? It was to sit there and list the people who were being condemned for the act that they have committed. He was to record all of the condemnations. Guess what the job of the scribe on the right was? Oh, this is good. His job was to write down all of the acquittals. His job was to record all of the ones who had been declared not guilty. Man, that gives me chills. Because guess what? Guess what that scribe is recording? Brian Moore, not guilty. Cliff Solly, not guilty. Arthur Farr, not guilty. Billy Stevens, not guilty. Why? Because we've been acquitted. All right, what does that sound like? That sounds like John chapter 3, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or to sit on the left side and write down all the condemnations. Instead, he came into the world that through the world, or but that the world through him might be saved. He came 
to write all of the acquittals. And he did so through the sacrifice of himself. The third truth that is stated in verse 1, and we'll end with this one. Why Jesus has a more superior ministry is because he is seated. It says we have such a high priest who is seated. So we looked at where he is seated. We looked at why he had the right to sit there being perfected forever. But what about the significance of being seated? This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated. This is the second time that the writer of Hebrews has referenced this and has expounded upon it. The first time came up right at the beginning of the letter, verse 3 of chapter 1, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now the major contrast here, we can read about it in Hebrews chapter 10, the major contrast is to the Levitical priests in the Old Testament who never had the right to sit down. They would never even think of sitting down once they got inside the tabernacle. Hebrews 10, 11 and 12 says, And every priest stands, ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Their work is never finished. It's continuous. They're having to constantly offer sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. I'll give you a a very practical reason why the priests never sat down in there. There were no seats. Okay, that's a pretty good reason, right? So not only was their work never finished, not only could they only be in there temporarily because they needed to get out of the presence of God before maybe they had a sinful thought, but there were no seats. There was only one seat in there, and it was the mercy seat. And they would not even think about even touching it or leaning on it because that was the seat where God's presence, His Shekinah glory dwelt. They definitely didn't have any right touching it or, or nonetheless sitting on it. So beyond the contrast, the symbolism here points or the difference points to the finished work of Christ who has sat down. And if there's only one seat in there, where did he sit? He sat on the mercy seat. The work of Christ versus the unfinished work and ongoing sacrificial system of the Old Testament. So what's the, what's the difference? What, this finished work of the high priest being seated as opposed to the continuous work of the priests never sitting. The earthly work was never finished. Their sacrifices were not sufficient. Their atonement was not actual or eternal. They simply pointed forward to a better one to come. This is why they never sat down. But Christ's work is finished. His sacrifice of himself was sufficient to reconcile us to God. And his atonement actually takes away our sin forever that's why he entered into the heavenly sanctuary completed his sacrifice once for all and then sat down in there he stayed in there he sat down at God's right hand that's what changes the covenant that's what changes the rules of the relationship that's what changes how we can engage with God a better covenant with better promises, I now get to go into the presence of God. How is that different than the old rules of the covenant? I had to have a priest go on my behalf, but I was never welcome to go in there. Under this new rules of relationship, I get to go in there because of the perfect priest and king who has sat down in there at God's right hand mediating and interceding on my behalf. I get welcomed in because of him. 
That's why we hold firm to the truth that Jesus is the only way to the Father. If he is not your high priest, you are not welcome in there because of your sin. The old sacrificial system offered temporary relief from the penalty of sin until sin was committed once again. It never fully provided rest and peace with God. What a joy it is to know that Jesus Christ in heaven has won that peace for us for all of eternity. That you, as the worshiper, can stand, as Hebrews 4 says, with boldness at constant peace, appeasement, propitiation, redemption in the presence of an almighty God. Why? Because you have a perfected high priest sitting at his right hand, writing acquittal, not guilty. I'm interceding for him. Not guilty. Justified. One of mine. Praise God for that. Amen. Isaac Watts wrote a song in 1709 titled, Not All the Blood of Beasts. I want to read two verses from that, from that song. It said, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ the heavenly Lamb takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Why does Jesus have a more superior ministry? It's because his ministry is eternal. It welcomes you, the worshiper, into the presence of God. And so, perfect presentation of the gospel for those of you that are here today that don't have a relationship with this high priest, there's no other way to declare it other than you are not welcome in God's presence. Why? Because there's not been anything eternally done with your sin. And God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so Jesus, as he proclaims of himself in John 14, 6... I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because I am the only sufficient high priest. I am the only sufficient sacrifice that will gain eternal peace between man and God. And it is through this new covenant, this new rules of the relationship, that you may enter the presence of God. Only through me. Our prayer is that you would trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have that eternal access that we've been studying about in the book of Hebrews. The writer's prayer is that these Jews that he's writing to would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would have that eternal access to God the Father. And so what a beautiful opportunity and segue we have into closing out this sermon with participating in the Lord's Supper. Because what do we do when believers participate in the Lord's Supper? We are reminded of the eternal sacrifice that was made so that I can be in God's presence. How appropriate it is that I get to remind myself of his death, of his beatings, of the price he paid for my sin while I'm in God's presence worshiping him. So here's what I want you to think about today. Of course, the the partaking in the Lord's Supper is only for believers. So if you are uncertain today that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and where you are at in that relationship, my greatest encouragement to you today is to be a spectator to the Lord's Supper. No one will look down on you. In fact, it is a noble thing to let those elements pass by and not participate than it is to do so wrongly, making a blasphemy or a shame upon the death that Jesus paid, the price that he paid. But for all of you who have trusted in Jesus Christ and believe that what he did on the cross, he did for you, then just remind yourself of that today. I was able to worship this morning because of this price. And so I want to tell you how we're going to go through this, we're, we're going to give everyone an opportunity. And Leon, if you could come join me on stage, uh, we're going to give everyone an opportunity to just spend a moment in prayer. During that prayer, you're saying, Lord,
please secure in me that I have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. But secondly, I want that relationship to be in right standing. I want to make sure that there's no sin in my life right now that will cause me to defile your name as I remind myself of what you did for me on the cross. Lord, please forgive me of those things as I worship you through the reminder of the crucifixion. And then, after everyone's had a time just to spend some time in prayer, our deacons are going to come. I'll close that time in prayer. They will come and they are going to serve the elements. They will be walking up and down each aisle. I want to go ahead and give you the instructions of how you can participate in the Lord's Supper. And that is that you reach in the tray that the deacon is holding. Uh, you don't have to grab the tray. Just reach in and grab one set of cups. There's a, there's a cup inside of another cup. That bottom cup has the bread in it and the top cup has the juice in it. Uh, we'll all partake at once. There's going to be a deacon that's going to pray over the cup of the bread, which reminds us of Jesus' body that was beaten for us. And then there'll be a deacon that prays over the cup of the juice that reminds us of Jesus' blood that was shed for us. And we will partake of the two elements following those two prayers. So let's begin a time of prayer right now. If you'll bow your heads, let's condition our own hearts, asking the Lord to secure in us uh, the relationship that we have in Him, but also to forgive us of any sin that we have committed and have not confessed. As our deacons come to prepare the elements, I just I want you to continue this time of prayer. And if you're here today and you're uncertain that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to talk to you about that relationship. That through Jesus Christ, you can have eternal access to an almighty God and live with him for all of eternity because of what Jesus has done for you. So I'm going to pray for our hearts, for our act of worship, and then our deacons are going to pass the elements. Father, this room is full of souls. Many of those souls have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we remind ourselves of that today. The body that was beaten, the blood that was shed, to make a way for us, sinners, to be washed clean of our sins, to have your wrath toward our sins fully satisfied. That's why we are able to worship you today. And now we remind ourselves of the price that it took. May you be honored in the way that we remind ourselves, that we remember. May you forgive us of our sins. Set in us the, the strong desire to repent of those sins and to be in right standing with you. But may this also be a, a stance of security in our relationship with Jesus Christ. As we remember what it took to establish this new relationship. May you be honored in the way that your church participates in the Lord's Supper. And for those among us who are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and have not entered into this personal relationship as they watch others around them participate. As children watch their parents participate. May it be 
a resounding proclamation of the gospel. A relationship that they too could have with an almighty God. Be glorified as we partake today in these elements in Jesus' name.